Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Karen Cito. I'm the Associate Dean for Research here at FES, and it is really an honor to welcome back Dr. Eleanor Sterling and uh, to Yale, to FES, to the Department of Anthropology uh, to accept this uh, amazing, uh, really amazing honor uh, to be the recipient of the Wilbur Cross Medal. Um, the Wilbur Cross Medal is really one of Yale's most prestigious awards to our alums. And Dr. Sterling is only the third FES alum to receive this uh, incredible honor. And you know, when you look at how they choose the winners for the uh, Wilbur Cross Medal, you can really see why Dr. Sterling was selected. So the medal recognizes a really small group of outstanding alumni who um, have achieved really distinguished achievement in three areas, in scholarship, in teaching, and also in public service. And when you look at Dr. Sterling's 50 plus odd pages of her CV, it's not, it, 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 there aren't really just a few highlights, it's 50 pages of incredible scholarship and commitment to teaching and outreach. Um, it's, you know, I can go on and on about uh, the things that she's done. I, I will, though, just highlight a few things from her CV that I think are particularly worth uh, while um, mentioning. So I think many of us in this room know that she's a graduate of Yale College um, from 1983 in psychology and also in biology. She stayed through and did um, the joint anthropology FES program and graduated in 1993. Um, her career has really spanned a variety of different uh, things from pure science and scholarship to really, again, this deep commitment to um, education. She is really one of the world's foremost authorities on uh, the II, the, this nocturnal lemur. And when you read about her um, research that led to her dissertation, she, so she spent all this time doing nighttime field work in Madagascar, uh, well before there were cell phones to figure out, uh, to find out where you were and all of that. So this, this is really uh, difficult work. Um, she is an expert in clearly anthropology and also um, in forestry. She's really in it, quite an intrepid explorer. And she's also a linguist. She has studied more than a dozen languages and not just the Germanic or Latin languages, but also Vietnamese and Kiswahili and Russian uh, and, and uh, also um, Hawaiian as well. Um, she has conducted field work in Asia, in, in Latin America, uh, in Africa. And in addition to her scholarship that many of us in this room are familiar with in terms of primates and her, her work in conservation, I don't know how many of you are familiar with her work both in research and outreach in terms of remote sensing. And so our paths crossed 12 years ago. Again, her deep commitment to education, we were developing materials together on how to use remote sensing for conservation and, and biology. Um, so really, her work has really spanned these three areas uh, very deeply. She's curated a number of exhibitions um, at the American Museum of Natural History. I just want to highlight this one, which is called uh, Water H2O Equals Life. You know, many of us in academia, we just hope that our work has broad impacts. We always say that we, you know, it's so many people have read our papers or whatever. Um, this, this exhibition traveled extensively across many states in the United States and then also traveled to a dozen different countries, ranging from the United Arab Emirates to Turkey to Brazil to Australia to Singapore. And so when you look at the people who actually write about this particular exhibit, it's very clear that she had a deep impact on thousands, if not millions, of lives that went to this exhibit, which is really quite remarkable. She's also a regular contributor to the New York Times blog, which is called Scientists at Work. And um, I mean, this is remarkable. For those of you who are not familiar with this blog, it really requires scientists to engage with the public and answer their questions, and then to have them posted online for everybody to read and comment on. Uh, which is, um, is, is really, I think, a reflection of her deep commitment to public service. So I will stop talking about her because clearly I can do it for a long time, uh, but please join me in welcoming Dr. Sterling.
Thank you very much, Karen. That's, um, that's more than I'm used to hearing about myself, so um, I will proceed with my talk. But I, I wanted first to say thank you to everyone here for, for coming to the event, and thank you to the deciders of the Wilbur Kloss uh, Medal. I am honored, deeply honored to be um, a recipient of this. I, I care so much about Yale and about the experiences that I had here and the people that I went to school with them, but the people that have come through since that I've met in other places. And I think there's an incredible wealth of, um, of uh, people out there who went to these to the forestry school and the, and the uh, Department of Anthropology who are making incredible differences in the world. And it's, um, it's amazing to be a part of that group of people, and I feel like I represent a team, a whole team here in this, uh, in this award and in this talk. So today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, what I call reflections on interdisciplinarity, because when I checked with the, the, the metal people about what specifically um, was interesting about, uh, I, I guess somebody put together, a, a, a somebody in this room put together, <laughs> A portfolio about why I might be a, a good recipient, the, the fact that I spend an enormous amount of time trying to bridge across difference uh, and work for interdisciplinarity was, was a, a deciding factor or something that was very important in the portfolio. So I thought I'd reflect on that and what I've learned from my time at Yale and uh, the time since then and the work that I've been doing. And in specific, uh, give you a sense for what that means for research and action in biodiversity from global to lo from local to global. And this is supposed to be advancing. It's gonna come up with another system. So I work at the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. I've worked there <clears throat> for 20 years now. And um, we at the center focus in on three main things. We focus in on applied research and always a connection to conservation action. We focus in on developing capacity. As Karen was saying, there's a huge commitment on developing capacity for conservation and on convening and connecting and getting people to think and reflect and collaboratively solve problems. We like to say that we transform knowledge from various sources from lots of different perspectives uh, into conservation action. And in doing that, we end up being what we call bridging or boundary organizations, a boundary organization in that we, um, we bridge across Western, and Western science and local ecological knowledge, across biological scientists and social scientists, across local communities and decision makers, and across um, the spectrum of, say, marine to terrestrial systems. These are only just a few examples of the things that we work to bridge. And what I'm gonna talk to you about today is the way that we work to bridge international global, generalized, uh, ex situ, we call it, knowledge production, where people around the world are learning from looking across multiple space, across multiple localities across space, to generalize about patterns, about systems, and a generalized understanding of how worlds function, how do systems function. And we're gonna be, and we work to think about that in relation to what we call a biocultural local approach that's essentially culturally informed, where knowledge that, uh, that draws from the community is used to uh, effectively manage systems as pe people as part of that system. And most of us in the anthropological world know that uh, very good-hearted people can go in with their generalized ex situ knowledge and try to help at the local level and you can have a number of different uh, possibilities. One possibility is that the local uh, knowledge system and community doesn't really understand the, the kind of information and the knowledge disconnect essentially results in a bouncing off of ideas or information or, or um, uh, this effort to bridge uh, in a more, uh, in a more detrimental situation, you can actually have that knowledge come and, in fact, break the local systems. And, and I'll give you some examples of that in, in a few minutes. Um, what ideally we all are working towards is a, a multiple knowledge synthesis, where there, the information that's available in the international arena that might not necessarily be a perspective uh, available to a local community is uh, brought in a way that's conducive to incorporation into that system, and that that local system then feeds into the more generalized international knowledge. We uh, have chosen to call this, uh, this figure eight, if you will, a research action arena. 
And in a research action arena, we believe that communities and managers recognize that they may not have all the tools and knowledge, especially as there's major changes coming into their systems that they have not faced in the past. And as there are technologies that are available to other people, um, downscale climate modeling or, or all kinds of things that are available to people that is possibly local communities may not have access to. We also, in this research action arena, have researchers who recognize that communities need to be involved in framing questions and in designing projects and participating in monitoring results, and that together this allows us to translate what we're doing into meaningful outcomes. So what we do at the Center for Biodiversity and Conservation, and in particular in the projects that I'm going to talk to you about in a minute, is we employ what we call a biocultural concept. And that concept essentially underscores the fact that human practices, knowledge, and beliefs influence and are influenced by the landscapes around human communities. And that there's an interweave, feedbacks between people in the environment that co-evolve through time and that allows for adaptation. And um, we argue that many conservation uh, approaches at this point don't necessarily take this into account. They define biodiversity without humans being a part of biodiversity. And so we think that there might be a way to take what we call biocultural approaches to resource management, to conservation, um, in which the goals and interventions are culturally grounded and appropriate that they build on the worldviews and values of local communities, and they focus on that feedback or the relationships between people in place, and that they're, uh, I just came from Hawaii, so I'm thinking about this in the back of my mind, but Aina based, they're living within resources and that connection to land and sea is strong, but also um, there's a, a strong knowledge about how far to go without um, long-term damage to a system. So what we're doing, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about in a minute, is uh, redefining how do we define success and how do we measure that success in the world if we take a biocultural approach. We're trying to foster the use of diverse knowledge sources by bridging suites of divides, linguistic, disciplinary, cultural, biological, social researchers, policymakers, local community makers. And we're trying to identify case studies of people who are already doing this out there that can show to the rest of the world what works. We ourselves are undertaking pilot biocultural approaches in one specific place in the Solomon Islands to, to uh, practice what we preach. And um, we're trying then to take a step back out to develop scaling between uh, local and global indicators of success. So if we were going to depict this graphically, which we are, and Nadav um, Gajit here in front of me is the, is the uh, beautiful designer of many of these. He takes our ideas and allows other people to see them in a much cleaner way than we're able to necessarily voice sometimes. This is a, a, a bit of an um, introduction to the way that the kinds of things that we're doing overlap. We have multiple grants that are overlapping and intersecting. We have a National Science Foundation grant that's looking at um, what is biocultural? How do we define it? Who's using these framings and what's working? What are indicators of success in these areas? And if we don't have them, uh, where, how can we develop some new ones? And the National Science Foundation grant um, that we have, a we have a five year grant then to really go deep with that into the Solomon Islands um, in the Pacific and, um, and just test out some of the ideas we're having. And then we have another grant that allows us to take a step back and bridge across local to global. And those are the three things that I'm going to focus in on today for you. Why are we focusing on indicators? What are indicators? Why are those an important thing for us to care about in this understanding of managing biocultural systems? Um, what are we doing in this biocultural approach to indicator development in the Solomon Islands? And uh, how are we trying to connect and why are we trying to connect local and global indicators? So indicators are essentially variables that allow us to summarize complex situations and communicate the complexity of that to other people. You can measure, quantify, uh, and communicate about that relevant information. And there are plenty of really terrific indicator sets out there, um, including some that are born here at Yale and, and used all around the world. Um, in many of these indicator sets, uh, 
the cultural piece is lacking. It's not integrated into our understanding of and our management of natural resources uh, or biodiversity. And what happens when um, you miss out on the cultural piece is that you forget that what we're measuring and how we measure it has an impact on the people and activities that are included or excluded from a given plan for action. And by leaving out the cultural piece, we actually um, exclude very possibly the, the very factors that motivate people to act or react. And we um, had an inkling of this by, by doing some initial work with local community members and reacting to some of these international metrics. And we talked to people around the world and we said, um, you know, do these mean anything to you, these indicators that are generated from the outside? And um, what we see, and in, in, uh, these are just quick summaries of the various things that we learned, but uh, Paige West just published an amazing book that you all should pick up right now, um, where she reports on the fact that when uh, she was working with people in Papua New Guinea, they said, I didn't know I was poor until these income generation projects came along and told me that I was poor. And Chris Filarity, similarly in the Papua, Papua New Guinea area, uh, uh, this I, I find just particularly poignant and heartbreaking, um, heard from a village chief who said, before my heart was full and my pockets were empty, and now my pockets are full and my heart is empty. This is exactly the opposite of what we want to be doing. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that we have a suite of frameworks that are uh, used in the international level to very quickly figure out how do we spend money to be most helpful. And those frameworks are built on vulnerability. <sighs> That is a very efficient way for us to figure out the people who are in the most need for the things that we think uh, from the international arena need to be done. And a quick example of this uh, is the United States government has a, a guide for measuring household food security, uh, which they use across the world to figure out which human populations are the most um, challenged in terms of, of nutrition. And they ask questions like, in the past 12 months, were you ever hungry but didn't eat because there wasn't any food? Did you reduce the size of your child's meal because there wasn't enough food? Or did child, were childs forced to skip meals because there was not enough food? And when we tried to pilot uh, these uh, types of things in the, in the Pacific region where we've been working, um, what we heard from people was, you can't possibly ask that question. Everybody has access to food. Everybody works to have access to food. People share food with each other. If somebody doesn't have food, somebody else gives you food. And asking this question is analogous in the United States to saying, how many times this week did you poison your child? Wait, wait, why, why do you think I would poison my child? And who are you to ask me that question? And poison? What are you talking about? And so really understanding what motivates people, how they work, and, uh, and how they frame things is critical. So framing things on a resilience, um, uh, building on strength uh, system would flip this to be able to ask questions like, what are the ways in which you ensure that no one in your community goes hungry? And how do you know, how do you ensure you have access after a tropical cyclone? Or, or you know, something measurable that people can compare across areas, how many days after a major disruption in your food source can you survive on existing or emergency foods uh, before, you need to do, before you need outside help or something, or something kicks in for your, your um, group that might be able to get food to you? So these are um, very important things. If you use a vulnerability framework, you set people up as victims. You set them up as waiting for somebody else to solve their problem. And you break the local system that's already there that's about resilience, that's about sharing food, that's about creating opportunities for multiple ways for people to always have access to food. Um, and the psychology of this, I, Karen mentioned that I was a psych undergrad. I actually ended up being a psych undergrad because it was the only place that they were teaching organismal biology at Yale. And yet, it has come in great handy, great use for me as I think about what motivates people to action, what motivates people to care, and to respond in emergency situations. So I keep using the term resilience, and I best imagine if there's some, some, of, some of the ecologists in the room who want to know what I mean by that, and I just thought I'd take a step back and say, we define resilience as the capacity of a community or a system to absorb, resist, or recover from stress. The, the, the definition here that we have is really critical in that we believe that resilience also represents transformation 
an adaptation and not just always looking back or always trying to maintain the steady state, but a, an ability to transform to a different state while maintaining valued functions and benefits. Um, and that is uh, tricky, but, in, but uh, we can talk about that in a bit. So that's the first piece of what I wanted, first piece of the puzzle I wanted to talk about. I could go in depth on any one of these for the entire talk, but I thought I'd give you a, a smorgasbord or a little um, teasers of each of them and then maybe in the discussion time you could ask uh, some more questions about them. So the second piece that I wanted to talk to you about was the National Science Foundation grant that we have to work for five years in depth in the Solomons with a suite of community members on um, thinking about how are they measuring success and how do they want to measure success, what does success look like in effective management of people interacting with the environment for healthy people in a healthy environment. A couple of you in the audience will be asking what, what does she mean by the Solomon Islands? Where is that place? So this is Australia. This is the uh, Solomon Islands. And then uh, it's a large set of islands. Together we work in this western province area in four different sites um, along the western province, four different communities. And um, the reason why we chose Solomon Islands uh, and the Pacific is because we believe that communities have experienced change, multiple types of massive changes through time, and they actually have inherently resilient communities, both biological and social and cultural communities that have experienced these disturbances through time on the one hand. On the other hand, there are major environmental changes that are unprecedented. There's major population growth that's way higher than in the past, and there's market forces that are really significantly different than in the past. So. They are resilient and they have uh, a lot of history with resilience, but they're also facing some things that, particularly with climate impacts, they may not themselves be able to predict or think through or they might be on a scale that they haven't met in the past. And there are some estimates that think that because of all of these things, the subsistence agriculture and coastal fisheries needs of some island populations may not be met by 2030, which is pretty soon. So we're working essentially to think through how to continue to reinforce the resilience of those communities. And we have a, a conceptual um, model of what we're trying to do and what we do is um, in the first step we basically have worked to build partnerships and collaborations across the different groups that might be able to participate in, uh, in contributing to a resilient future for these communities. And of course at the apex of that are communities, but we also saw roles for government agencies and researchers, and we formed a group of people who are very interested in thinking about this. How can we, how can we work towards a, a, a resilience in these communities in the, in the Solomon Islands? And the second step we did was to do a suite of um, visioning exercises. What is the future look? To, what do you, where do you want to be in the future? What do you, what do you like about where you, where you are now? What do you want to change? Um, looking at the current state, looking at the future state, doing some comparisons and thinking through where do we want to be and setting some goals for that. And through that process, you then identify um, indicators of success along the trajectory to those goals as a group at, in a co-production process. And then you measure those indicators and try to see, well, where are things now? And then try to do some modeling and uh, discussions to work towards alternative future scenarios and allow people to, to recognize what might happen if they choose one avenue or another avenue and what are the, the uh, resulting consequences from those choices. And that then feeds into management planning that then, of course, starts the whole process all over again. Um, and in the whole time that we're doing this, uh, in thinking about interdisciplinarity and different groups with different ideas and perceptions, we're basically trying to capture in every step of the way what every different group wants to get out of it. Even though we all have some common goals, we have to recognize that individual groups also have, um, and individuals within individual groups, have varying needs and interests. The research researchers may have uh, uh, want to understand the drivers of resilience, the community managers want very specific, what do I do when in order to achieve a resilient system? And policymakers are forced to report on national and global targets and they have a suite of, um, of, of agreements that they basically have to make do on. So for instance, the uh, uh, outcomes, so the perspectives and, and the entry points for these folks might be different, which also means that they may have differences in the outcomes 
meaningful outcomes for each interest group. And what we've tried to do is map those outcomes onto uh, a, a work plan so that everybody gets what they need out of it while there's still a collective um, good. So for instance, the meaningful outcomes from the research perspectives might be uh, that learning is produced that can enable comparisons across communities, islands, regions, et cetera. Um, just a, a quick example of a local perspective, people might want to have agreed on rules that ha allow them to have sustainably managed resources or they might want to apply the appropriate science as well as local knowledge to inform um, their decision making. Um, they want, might want to have a way to understand the feedbacks between people and the environment that make the communities more resilient to future uh, shocks that they might be facing. And underlying all of that is a respect for communities, a respect for their ideas, for their knowledge, for their sources of knowledge, their rights to say, I want to be part of this or I don't want to be a part of this. FPIC means free prior and informed consent before a project starts. And project intellectual property as well. Meaningful outcomes for the government, as I mentioned, might be a better understanding of trajectories of, of human well-being across the country and then an ability to report on that to the outside agencies and conventions in which they are party. So you don't have to read this, but just so you know that it starts to look like this, where we have short-term, medium-term, and long-term outcomes for every single group, some of them communal and other of them individually, and FAST becomes uh, a tricky exercise in keep, keeping track of everything. Um, I bet there are people, you in the audience, who are saying to me, she keeps talking about biocultural indicators. What in the world does she mean by biocultural indicators? Well, to be honest with you, we thought we knew what biocultural indicators were when we went into this process. And um, after spending a lot of time with the Solomon Islanders, we all actually changed what we thought bi biocultural indicators meant. And what I'm going to do now is show you the end product of that whole process of talking through what are important indicators for us. So uh, th I have three examples for you. The first example I'm going to use is uh, trochus. Trochus are really important invertebrate species that are found in the marine system in the Solomon Islands. People love these. They love them for eating. They love them for, um, for shells. In the, in the uh, Pacific, shells have traditionally been very, very important. This is a shell. Um, this is a shell necklace. It's not a necklace. It's a shell ceremonial um, product from the Papua New Guinea from a colleague of mine, John Ainey, who gave it to me. And it's, it's representative of enormous amounts of work and enormous wealth um, for people. So people really value these different kinds of shells, not just for food, but also for um, cultural reasons. <clears throat> and um, right now, people are concerned about trochus populations in some places. And so uh, biologists might come into an area and be very concerned about the size structure of a population. They want to know, is there compliance within the minimum size limit so that we can maintain this population into the future? Anthropologists or social scientists might be interested in the, the percentage of the local resource management rules that the communities are aware of and follow. So that's an indicator, a standard social indicator. A biocultural indicator is more complex. It might actually ask, what's the percentage of people who are fishing these, these invertebrates who say they only catch them because they know the minimum size um, that they need to do to be able to reach the reproductive maturity to replenish the stock. So they have an understanding of the biology of the system to be able to manage it effectively. Second example we came up with was lots and lots of endangered fish populations. Uh, people from a biological standpoint might come in and say, okay, we need to know what's the current size, what's the, where was it before, what are the trends in the in endangered fish population size. You might be able to modify that a little bit and say, well, we want to know not just about the endangered fish that biologists from the external world think are important, but there might be culturally important fish populations that we need to maintain at a particular level for our population needs that don't really have a biologically uh, relevant, it doesn't hit a critical point from a biological standpoint before there's action. Uh, people do a lot of feasting and they need enormous amounts of fish for those feasts. And the population size might be fine for reproduction from a biology standpoint, but not big enough for the feasts to be able to support that population. So that's a good example of a culturally important fish population size indicator. 
But actually, if you tried to understand resilience, where you need to know fast and slow-growing aspects of a system, you might actually be trying to measure not just one but several species where you're looking at culturally important slow-growing fish species and culturally important fast-growing fish species. So those are other examples. Um, and my final example of a... Um, of an in a biocultural indicator is uh, a lot of people, a lot of us try to measure trends and benefits that are derived from people being able to get resources from an ecosystem. We call those ecosystem services, food, water, um, other things, and we're interested in changes over time and how much of a benefit uh, do people get from an, a particular ecosystem. A uh, cultural indicator might actually be related to that, might actually be maintenance of traditional crafts or arts or ceremonies or, or other cultural expressions. And you're saying to me, I don't understand how that's related to ecosystem services, but it's actually fundamentally related to it through an index that might look at trends in time that people spend to reach a particular um, plant or animal that are used for these crafts and ceremonies. And that reflects two things. It reflects um, the care of and the interest that people have in that particular thing because they're going out to find it, and then also how far away it is compared to what it used to be and what might be a, an erosion in the, the, the quality of the population um, so that they have to keep going farther and farther away in order to get it. <clears throat> so we think that biocultural indicators are very important. They complement other types of indicators. We are not arguing that we should go out there and chuck everything that everybody's already done and only come up with biocultural indicators because they're the only important thing in the world. Definitively not saying that. We think they're really fundamental for measuring other parts of the system that aren't being measured at the moment. They're also measuring fundamentally and by definition, by our definition, what is most important for community members. And that we keep forgetting when we come in with our best effort outside um, focus and outside uh, values driven uh, indicator groups. Uh, one of the most important things we keep learning over and over is that it may be more important in having a discussion about what's important and trying to think about what people agree on as an indicator than any kind of precise indicator you come up with. A lot of times it's the, just the process of people getting together and thinking about what do they want in the future, how is it looking now, what do they need to do, and then get, galvanizing some action that is... Um, potentially more important than having a 3.216 uh, um, measurement of a particular thing. And then key and not fixed and not, not uh, solved yet is uh, the, the fundamental consideration of how do you take these multiple forms of knowledge, the types of indicators that are already generated, the biocultural indicators, and try to um, synthesize the information you're getting from that to be able to be effective in your decision making and generate adaptive change. So as we were working on these indicators in the Solomon Islands and uh, trying very hard to learn from other indicator sets around the world, we were constantly seeing disconnects between what we're measuring across the world and what people in the local communities want to have measured, what they think are the elements of success. And so we, so we, we then added on this third project um, here on the bottom that's funded by the Science for Nature and People Partnership um, which allows us to sort of understand what, how, are there, how can we scaffold between these international indicators which, which we know are helpful and useful in some kinds of settings and in uh, prioritizing action at the international arena and the very important locally grounded ones. There's a little bit too much of a disconnect at the moment. And what can we do to try to link those? And Nadav came up with this great graphic after I described what we're trying to do. He's actually part of the, uh, intellectually part of the team, so um, he was able to sort of help us to think about ways to show this. And so we've just depicted those international metrics. This could be the Convention on Biological Diversity. It could be Aichi targets. It could be the Sustainable Development Goals. It could be anything that's sort of generated from the outside. It tends to be well-organized, boxed, um, hierarchical, and very... Um, easy to, to understand how one thing relates to something else. Um, in the terms of the local indicators that we've been hearing about and coming up with, there's a much more uh, fluid sets of relationships. It's very hard for people to box things because every time you ask what category something would go in, they say, but this is related to that, which is related to that, so I don't get it. I don't even know what you're asking me to do. So, so the, the system even of thinking and understanding how a system works and how do you track that is very um, 
interconnected and uh, narrative uh, rather than um, the kind of sort of organized. Um, and to some extent, uh, especially with the international indicators, uh, compromised because there's so many groups that are trying to agree on the sustainable development goals or the IET targets, you end up with a subset of what everybody wanted and almost um, a little bit of what nobody wants um, in, in, these, in the descriptions, at least, of some of these indicators. So it's this messy part in the middle that really interests us and that we're really trying to focus in on. And we're trying to address this by actually uh, um, bring, coming at this central section from two directions. We're actually starting in the local and moving towards the center, and then we're starting, sorry, we're starting in the global, moving towards the center, and we're simultaneously starting in the local and moving towards the center. And let me show you what that looks like. So sustainable development goals came out last year. There are 17 goals, very interesting, interconnected uh, human uh, biological systems. Um, there are multiple indicators under every single one of these goals, so there's an incredibly enormous list of indicators that countries now are requested to report on so that the international arena can help to keep track of how things are going across the world. It's daunting for people at the local level, I'll tell you that right now, but what we've actually done is to sit down with the decision makers and the people who have to report on this, as well as local community members, and we've asked them to, to sort all of these indicators into different categories. And so what they do is they sort them into categories of, yeah, that, that indicator makes sense to us. We can measure that on the local level and we can use it for our decision making. Or, you know what, it's not really relevant to us, but we're fine measuring it for those other people. Or, it's not relevant to us and we don't feel like this has any resonance or ability to be, to be uh, measured at our local community level. Or, Something needs modification, either we need a new indicator that re represents the things that we care about that aren't captured in this uh, goal, or uh, the indicator that the international arena has already come up with needs some kind of modification, culturally grounded, to be useful and appropriate at the local level. And I'm just going to give you a really quick example. Um, it, target 6.1 in the Sustainable Development Goals says by 2030 we need to achieve universal and equitable access to safe and affordable drinking water. We're all behind that. Every single person I ever spoke with said, yep, that's us, yep, absolutely. Good thing, let's see, figure out how we can work on that. So the environmental indicators that are out there right now to measure that look at the level of contamination below a certain toxicity, toxicity to humans. Again, when I first walked into this with my lens, I said, how could that not be something you would measure on the local level and resonate across everybody? And then I started to work with people in New Zealand and they said, you know, sure, absolutely, that's good, we like that. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And that is because in uh, parts of Maori culture, there's something called spiritual pollution, where, where, where water may, for instance, exit a system and enter into a, a factory and something happens to it there, and people mess with it there, and then it gets clean, and it gets sent back into the system. So by the first indicator, it is perfectly uh, functional. It's, it's, it's uh, um, below any kind of level of toxicity to humans. But the Maori may feel that whatever happened to it when it left the system, or whatever happened to it with the way that people touched it, that there was a kind of a physical contamination, uh, sorry, a, a kind of a spiritual contamination that's irrelevant um, to the physical contamination. So we need both of these metrics to be able to understand the health of a system in the Maori uh, region. So that's a, an example of ways that we can um, use, a, a value existing metrics, but also point to other metrics that need to be considered for people to be able to make effective decisions at the local level. On the flip side, we have this um, linking local to global indicators, and the way we're doing that is that we're trying to, to, to work across multiple parts of the Pacific. We're focusing on the Pacific for the moment, although we have colleagues that are doing similar work in other parts of the world. And we're trying to understand what's important locally and who and what, who, who's using indicators out there already to measure what's important locally. And one of the ways that we're doing that across the Pacific is we're getting people together to envision a resilient Pacific community. Across the Pacific in different places, people are coming together to answer these questions. What are the characteristics, specific characteristics of a resilient community? 
And we also ask them to do uh, pretty fun things, actually, which is doing things like close your eyes and imagine that one of your ancestors from 200 years ago arrived today in your community. And what's a, what's, what does that person find to be surprising in your community now? What's missing from what was there before? And what's really cool and interesting that the, the, the ancestor might be pretty interested in learning more about? And through that process, we get people to really um, deeply reflect on what's important to them. We ask them other questions that help with that, like things like, what do you want your community to be known for? Not internationally, but within other communities or within your community yourself, a particular recipe, uh, success in growing pumpkins in your, in your reef system, which is true in one of the places. Um, so what is your, your community currently known for and how is that different from what you want your community to be known for? So these are different ways that we're exploring the characteristics of a successful, resilient, sustainable biocultural community. And one of the things that we're finding uh, in, in there is that there are significant, as you would imagine, indicators that are missing from the sustainable development goals. And what struck me over the last year as we've been doing this work is that every single community that we work in, Hawaiian, Fijian, Marshallese, Papua New Guinean, has a word or comes up with a term or a phrase pretty much almost immediately when we ask this question. Laurima in Hawaiian, Sole Solivaki in Fijian, La Ledron in Marshallese, and it means working together for a greater good. This is what communities in the Pacific think contributes to resilience and sustainability. We're not measuring it, and in fact, in some ways, we're breaking it down with our international metrics. And let me give you an example of that. Colleagues of ours are working in, uh, in, uh, in the Americas, and uh, there's uh, an international system that they're using to measure poverty. And the communities uh, are simultaneously working on developing their own system of measuring what is a good life. And they develop um, calidad de vida, quality of life management plans, so that they have a happy, healthy environment and happy, healthy humans living in that happy, healthy environment. And these processes are happening simultaneously. And uh, what we have found is that the, the internationally driven metrics that are being used by the national government point to communities that live very close to forests and far away from markets as being hugely impoverished and in need of help. Those communities in, are inversely, <laughs> proportionally saying that they are the happiest and ha healthiest communities out there by the metrics that are important to them. And interestingly, they're challenging these questions of why do you say that we're not rich? And the, the counters come back and say, well, it's because um, in these other communities that are rich, everybody has their own television set, and you only have one. And everybody has to go to the same place to watch TV. And the communities are like, what are you, what are you talking about? We, go to, we only have one because that's where we go and hang out, and we talk to each other, and we share, and we laugh at the same TV program, and it builds our community. So you want to give us all our own televisions, so we go off in our living rooms and we break down that community cohesion, and that's what wealth is? So these are really important things that we need to capture and understand and work towards in um, the international arena so that we don't, um, so that we help and do no harm. Um, the second thing that's really, really critical, especially in the Pacific right now, is this uh, idea of a second thing that came out frequently across, well, actually it came across, across all of the communities we spoke with was a connection to place. And people um, are worried about the fact that in some of these communities, they're going to have to move. In the Marshall Islands where we're working, possibly 2030 is a target for when people are going to need to move because the water is going to be so high that they can't live in the land that they have lived in for generations. And so there are really good thinking, feeling people out there who are trying to understand what's going on with these communities and they're buying them land in Fiji and an island over here and an island over there and the metrics that they're using to determine where those new lands should be are how many palm trees are in this place and how many parrot fish were in that place and then they want to translate that into this new spot and they say same same. But what they're not getting is that in the Pacific the place where your placenta is buried, the place where you can trace your roots back to your mother and your grandmother and your grandma's grandmother and all the way through to the first people who came to that place, that's the most important thing for them. They don't care about the number of parrot, well they do care about the number of parrotfish, but the, 
fundamentally, when you ask them, what do you care about, they come up with a connection to place as the first thing. And we need to understand that when we're thinking about how do we address the fact that they're going to have to move. So we're trying now to think about that messy middle section about the scaffolding between the international and national and uh, international and local. And we recognize that the key, the linchpin to all of this is that national level uh, work, that national level reporting to the international agencies, and that national level um, uh, translation of resources from the outside to communities that need them in order to make the decisions that they want to be making to have happy, healthy communities into the future. And there are groups out there that are doing very interesting and exciting things. There's something called the Melanesian Wellbeing Indicators, which is a national level um, accounting strategy that's being undertaken in Vanuatu. They are crossing the entire country and asking everybody a suite of questions about locally important uh, indicators, but also meshing those with the international indicators and finding ways to translate that information from what they're learning at the local, at local level into what needs to be talked about at the international level. So not just saying, yes, we took your metrics, but yes, we took your metrics, but this thing is way more important. So if you're going to be interested in uh, coming in and offering aid, we suggest that it be at, in this level because this is what we have determined as a country to be values for ourselves based on our community's needs and interests. So we're hoping that the work that we're trying to do across these areas uh, will, will help to uh, facilitate those dialogues. We uh, at the American Museum of Natural History happily live in New York City, so we can um, have some intense discussions with United Nations folks, not, again, to change the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, which is an incredible undertaking, but to find ways to broaden the discussion about what happens once you're looking at those SDGs and the indicators to figure out what happens next. So um, I think a year and a half ago here, I gave a quick talk on um, interdisciplinary work and some of the work we were doing, and I put up a quote that I think um, I'm going to put up again, but I actually, in the intervening time, have learned a little bit, and I want to modify the quote. So the quote is by Roland Barthes. He's a, a French sociologist, we should say. In 1994, in Jeune Chercheur, he wrote uh, interdisciplinary work, so much discussed these days. It's not about confronting already constituted disciplines, none of which, in fact, is willing to let itself go. To do something interdisciplinary, it's not enough to choose a subject or a theme and gather around it two or three sciences. Interdisciplinarity consists in creating a new object belongs to, and he said no one, and I say everyone. So thank you very much. I think I left a few minutes for questions, if anybody has any. Dr. Sterling, I'm John Grimm here uh, teaching at uh, Forestry and Environmental Studies in Religion and Ecology. And I feel uh, the biocultural concept is uh, so strongly supportive of breaking down what some ecological philosophers call that great divide, huh? the nature-culture divide, or however we, we speak of that divide. Uh, I wanted to pursue um, the very interesting emphasis in your talk on the indicators and the stress on, of course, the measurement capacity of the indicator to measure success and, the, of course, the presumptions underlying that. I wanted to uh, raise the question, is it possible then that these biocultural indicators from the local region might also have different measurement agenda too? I I'm thinking specifically, say, of a, a narrativity so rather than quantifying uh, the parrotfish, but rather the stories about the uh, parrotfish. And then just to conclude my question, I'm feeling a rather strong example of this in my own area of study in terms of the Hunkpapa Lakota and the, re, the, the uh, resistance uh, to the pipeline. And I'm feeling uh, the resistance here is the generativity of uh, mitakuyasin, 
all my relations say the Lakota people. So it's the same thing, this everyone pulling together, this, uh, again, a, a kind of a life way concept. But uh, I'm interested in uh, pursuing in my own research then the forms of narrativity that will grow out of this as a contemporary expression of the resilience and literally a measure uh, in the local context. So thanks for that rambling question. That's a wonderful question. Thank you, Dr. Grimm. I, I, um, every work you and your partner do is, is so inspirational to me, and it's, it's fundamental. I didn't speak specifically about spirituality and religion per se, but it's such a fundamental part of everything that people are doing, and, and we value a lot of work you're doing. I did, um, Nadav and I did try to make this a little bit more sort of narrative uh, focused as opposed to sort of um, quantitative. Uh, as You do have qualitative metrics, by the way, in these international arenas, but uh, they are, especially for comparative purposes, often focused in on the quantitative. And we are absolutely grappling with that because people don't share quantitative information to be able to, like, no, you don't talk to your neighbor and say, oh, I had 650, um, I captured 650 fish today, and how many did you get, and my population size is declining by X number or whatever. You say, I've seen fewer fish, or I, you know, I used to go in this long voyage, and I went over this place and into that place, and, the, and it's, it is narrative, and so <coughs> we absolutely need to figure out ways to create those narratives and create narratives in a way that help to inform the national, at least, level decision making that affects the local. Um, and I just think that is a fundamental piece of what we have to do. And, and I thank you for calling that out. Um, and I completely, I would love to actually get the, the name of the, the working together for the greater good or the life ways uh, that you just mentioned, because I'm really interested. I know it's not specific to the Pacific, but I think that electricity with which people come up with it as one of the most important things in their lives compared to the things that get filtered into these uh, consensus indicators is really important and interesting. And I think we're losing uh, sight of what's important when we spend so much time trying to measure and monitor and quantify things, um, which isn't to say measuring and monitoring and quantifying is all bad, but we need to consider other connections uh, and other aspects and other things that drive people to decide to do, to, to be in a certain way. So it's a really important comment that you made that I, I, every time you guys come to my talks, I think about different ways to, to incorporate what you're doing and how you're thinking into what we do. Appreciate it. Hi, um, I'm Heather Harrington. I'm a undergraduate here at Yale College. And uh, I was just wondering, are there ever times when uh, the quantifiable data conflicts with local narratives and forces uh, either local narratives to consider changing, or does that not happen and are local narratives normally pretty much in line with the data? It happens all the time. Um, and, and that's the tricky part, because uh, we tend, and, and when I was a graduate student, I, I probably started off in this field saying, well, I'm really interested in how local communities think, and what we need to do is validate their ideas or their suggestions based on our biological science, and if it doesn't intersect, then maybe there's something wrong with their local knowledge. I don't know if I went that far, but that's the implication about validating. And there's some really, really, really exciting and interesting work coming out around the inter Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is like the IPCC, the climate change uh, work, but around biodiversity, about what they're calling uh, multiple evidence-based decision-making or thinking across multiple knowledge systems and how can you bring the best available information to the table but that's validated within the knowledge systems of the information generators and then brought to the table. And I was saying at lunch today that one of my really, my passions right now is thinking about what do you do with difference? There's difference all the time at these decision-making tables. And um, we tend, especially as I think, making a generalization as a biologist, to want to uh, come to a consensus and have, you know, move forward with data that mesh from the two sources. But I'm really interested right now in thinking about ways that we can deal with difference that are um, recognizing the difference, uh, validating and understanding those differences or, or respecting those differences, but not trying to bring them together. You can build 
uh, mounds around those differences so you can meet higher up. Uh, you can find a lot of different ways to deal with the difference. What happens initially when you find those differences is you get incredible conflict where people are like, my system's right and your system's wrong. And one of the ways that we deal with that, and I bet my friend Louise Burnham does this in the work that she does in the urban areas of Boston, is to figure out where are the commonalities and start with those to try to understand where, where do people agree on things and get them together and recognizing that there is stuff they agree on. And then trying to understand why they're having different reportings or understandings or, or perspectives are, are their per, different perspectives are producing different um, sets of data or different um, solutions or different uh, um, um, interpretations of what's going on in a particular area. And I think we just have to embrace difference and figure out how to deal with it rather than being scared of it or trying to get rid of it or trying to, or using it as a crutch to just get mad at the other. So I don't have a great answer for that, except that it's a, it's a method. It's a methodological thing rather than um, one trumps the other or it's always like this. And, and <laughs> to say, I, I, I don't think I've ever been at the table where all the data matches up. There's always something. Mm -hmm. It's being um, simulcast, so there are people in the, maybe people in the web world who would love to hear your voice. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, Mary Evelyn Tucker, and thank you so much. This was uh, wonderful, and I do hope that we can continue to imagine ways to work together. But the, I just wanted to mention your, your point about the Pacific people's language for a common good. Um, Confucianism, that is my own area of study, the whole point of a society um, like that is a communitarian society so that any type of self-cultivation is for a common good, mm. which is why they have a strong educational philosophy, a hugely strong political philosophy, um, a, a, a philosophy about the natural world and so on. But the idea is you're not cultivating yourself or you're not even educating yourself, but you're doing it to be of service to the larger society. Mm. So I think that would support hugely your point. Yeah. And I, you know, we have it here in the States. I mean, when, when people were telling me, they say, do you guys have that? And I said, well, there's this thing called barn raising, you know, and we have, a, we have terms for this. And I will argue that right now in our society, we're losing sight of it. Right now in the United States in particular, in our political agendas, in our work, in the way that we value certain things, we're, we're losing sight of that working together for a common good. And I, I believe that we can break through what's stopping us from doing that, those differences that we keep emphasizing to find our way back to something that will help us to really be healthy populations in the future. But it's, it's found in so many places around the world. I, I, I spoke here only at the Pacific because that's where we're doing our work, but I agree that it's reflected in so many different places. And let's find that. Let's keep that up. Hi, I'm, I'm Erica. I'm an undergrad here. Um, I had sort of a follow-up question. Um, I had an experience this summer in um, – Zambia, um, or I went to a, a school that the African Wildlife Foundation had built for a community in exchange for um, conservation work in terms of elephant pathways. And I, I was thinking about it during your talk. And I was wondering if you could speak to coming out of a place of, um, of the sort of biocultural indicators that you're talking about, what action plans for conservation look like between those two kinds of the quantitative and the, and the narrative um, pathways in terms of, you know, how does the community and the international scientific community, how do those blend in terms of action plans? Yeah, Erica, that's a terrific question. Um, I think they blend in, uh, in a number of ways, and, it, and, and what's really critical is for leaders who are decision makers to recognize the, the, the importance of both and to not to lose the narrative in the reporting to other sources, to donors, to, to the government or whatever. Um, and to find ways to continue to, to promote local systems of knowledge exchange that tend to be narrative rather than reporting on things and flip charts and pie graphs or whatever. And, and I think that, um, well, Georgina Komen, who was here as an undergraduate and then was at a bunch of other places and is back at the Museum of Natural History now, thinking about some of these things, has been doing a really neat jo job of trying to look around the world at who is implementing these, bio what does biocultural mean to people around the world and who is implementing these? 
And, and how are they finding these, what I might call hybrid systems of, of management and reporting and thinking that, that allow for, for both? And um, I don't know, George, you have any good quick examples to share? I'm putting her on the spot. <laughs> Anyways, we can talk about it afterwards, but uh, go ahead, you got, you got the mic. <laughs> um, well, I think that you would maybe start with a question of what do you want? Um, which, I mean, I can't speak to what the African Wildlife Federation or Foundation did in Zambia, but I wonder if that school structure was the thing that everybody would have decided that they wanted first. Um, and, I mean, when we were doing this work in the Solomons, it was really hard to come up with our vision for the future. And that's trying to sweep away what people's expectations might have been from previous engagements with outside folks and how that kind of creates this expectation of what aid looks like or what um, help might look like and saying okay let's figure out together what is it really what is um what what is the good that we're looking for for our future um so how creating that space for redefining together um it's really creative and exciting but you have to be really uncomfortable for a while and nothing happens for a while oh my gosh <laughs> yeah that's a really good point we can talk some more, Erica. It's a really important question. And I'm really interested in what you guys were doing in Africa. Uh, hi, I'm Adam Eichenwald. I'm a master's in environmental science student at FES. Um, I have a further question about biocultural indicators. Um, a lot of time, I've, um, from what I understand, they can adapt and change based on, <laughs> you know, uh, surrounding ecosystems, differences in culture, you know, in, inputs and outputs into like a, a cultural uh, community. So, how how does um, maybe uh, your way of, of looking at it is it is it able to adapt and change as cultures change? And if so, like how does that happen? Oh my gosh, Adam, that is such a really sophisticated and important question. And um, what I was glossing over in the talk today is that indicators have two important properties. One of them is sort of a description of what it is and what it encompasses. But another of it is uh, what's the benchmark or what does good, bad look like? And we struggle all the time because coral biologists who work with me are like, you know, we know what a good coral reef looks like. It doesn't have a lot of algae on it. You know, you can, maybe you can argue about percentage of algal cover, but there's, you know, it's a diverse system with a lot, of, a lot of coral and not a lot of algae. And that doesn't change terribly much through time. Whereas a biocultural system, the value that somebody places on what that system looks like, in fact, there might be places around the world where algae is really great because the women go out and they harvest the algae and they make a lot of money off of it or they eat it or whatever. And therefore, they may want an algal-dominated reef system, which isn't necessarily the same thing as a biologist wants. Um, we approach that in a couple of different ways. We ensure we're not looking at cultural issues, which is what one would do if one looked at just how do you extract as much as you can from the environment so your algal covered um, coral reef is the right answer. In a biocultural system, the bio is as strong as the cultural. And so we, we really work hard to understand what that looks like and what that means. But the other thing that's really key and that we have to remember is that um, we can set those benchmarks and then modify them as our cultures or our visions of what success or, or value looks like changes. Now, the tricky part is that you can do that in, in endogenously to one community and look at that community over time and have it be fairly um, useful in making decisions. But what's hard is then comparing that community to other communities through time and, and across space. And that's what we're struggling with. And so one of the things, for instance, the, the uh, parameter that we came up with on food security came out of our colleagues in the Marshall Islands um, who, uh, who set, came up with actually a fixed number of days that they felt they could survive um, until they got some, some help if their entire food, food uh, um, system was cut short. That number itself may differ across different places in terms of proximity to markets or ability to get in touch with what in uh, the Solomon Islands you call your one talk, the people who speak your same language, your family members who might be able to send stuff. Those people could be as far away as the United States. And it might take some time for those um, supplemental resources to arrive in a time of emergency. So 
I actually think it's totally fine for individual communities to, to choose the value of what they care about and to share that with others to say, we need help or we don't need help. And not rely on an international standardized metric that says, well, you don't really look like you need that much help compared to this other um, community or something. And that it's going to take more nuance than we currently have in our systems to try to fix this, I think. Thank you. Great question. So, Karen's like, Fred. Uh, I'd love to. <laughs> Hello, Eleanor. I'm, I'm Fred Streeby. I teach writing courses uh, here in, in FES and at Yale. So, Eleanor, I have a question about your, the language of um, working for a greater good. It would be real. So, and at your language, you've repeated it, working for a greater good, not working for the common good, working for a greater good. Uh, I'm guessing that the comparative is important in interesting ways. And I'm wondering if you speak in, in ways that in fact are defining in different communities. Um, would no, you? They, they, yeah, I, I'm misusing the English for that because for them, for the people who've spoken with me about it, it's a common good. And I meant greater not in comparison, but greater as in the community. Lovely. The greater okay. than the individual. So no sense, even as you stop and think about it, that, that greater may um, be relative and be an indicator of you know, that there's a greater good for our community than in yeah, others I, that don't appreciate algae. Um, uh, I'm just, I'm just, maybe the answer is no, that's, I can think I'm about just I mean, basically in Sole Sole Vati, when the people in Fiji, Fiji were describing that, it meant um, if you needed your garden cleaned out and irrigated and planted, and, and the season for doing all of that was a week long and there were 15 people who all needed it, it was better for the entire community for everyone to go to your garden on Tuesday and his garden on Wednesday and her garden on Thursday and just get it all done. Okay, neat. So Thanks, that Rob. was the way they described to me the greater good. Uh, they didn't use the word common, but it did not should be language issue too. Um, so yeah, it wasn't necessarily greater than what it is now. It was yeah. it was about the community. So common good. I think maybe I should change that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for tackling it. Thank you so much. Happy to stay. Talk to you yeah. Um, but thank you, thank you all for coming. Time.